Hello and welcome to our seventh week of English 112. Uh, we are way past the halfway mark. I, I don't know why I neglected to mention that at week five, but uh, this is, you know, our, our seventh week and we're getting much closer to the end here. Uh, today we're talking about drama, specifically much ado about nothing. We're also going to talk about the article from JSTOR uh, about deception in the play. And also, I want to very quickly go over your responses to this last forum post. So the first thing I'd like to do is mention uh, some of the highlights in the forums, uh, both the, the strengths and the weaknesses therein. So the first thing that stood out to me was someone uh, drew a connection between Dubliners and... Uh, Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, which I think is an excellent connection, one I hadn't even thought to do myself. But essentially, we have characters who are victims of a system, of a society, of a certain type of oppression that exists in their lives. So it's an excellent connection, one that I think that you could uh, maybe even look at in your final paper. I don't know that that would fit any of the uh, particular prompts. Sort of uh, looking at another example that I thought was pretty good and it really stood out. Uh, somebody mentioned, you know, the they're all victims of a system, right? Even this, the competition itself is part of the system. It's, it's not just exploiting other people, but exploiting themselves. Uh, I thought that was a very good point to bring up. Really good point I noticed. Uh, somebody sort of drew a parallel between Link as sort of the weakest character in the play and Roma is the strong, strongest ca character in the play. I would almost say uh, these two characters sort of represent uh, what we might call a dichotomy, um, sort of the ends of the spectrum, if you will, when it comes to masculinity. I mean, R Roma is definitely on the high end. He is the super manipulative. He gets what he wants. Um, there is nothing standing his, in his way. Whereas Link is the complete opposite. He's completely vulnerable. He act, he lacks any kind of confidence. Um, he's very easily swayed, which is a stark contrast to a lot of the other male characters that we see in the play. So that was a very good point as well. One other thing I'd like to mention about the forum posts, and this is something that's always been an issue. It's probably going to always be an issue. Uh, I hope not. Maybe, hopefully, by this, I think the next one might be our last. Uh, that we can sort of start to move away from that. And that is uh, summary, the emphasis summary. At least this is something that you need to move away from in your papers. I believe I've mentioned this in a previous video, but definitely on the forums themselves. Remember, summary is not analysis. You're not analyzing by telling someone what happened in the play. Uh, assume your reader... In, in this case, your reader always has read the work. They're familiar with the text. So you're picking out small examples that demonstrate something greater. Um, you know, I, I noticed that a lot of you would summarize and then give your conclusion. Well, it doesn't really work that way. You know, you want to give your conclusion and then outline the specifics of how you got there. Um, it's not necessarily wrong to leave your conclusion to the end. You, that is a, a way you can do it. But typically, especially with academic form and its rigidity and that fact that you're typically expected to write a thesis that provides an argument and your reasoning, you know, you still want to try to conform to that form. So, again, avoid too much summary. Give the basics. Get to the meat, your point, your claim. That's what we're really interested in. Uh, it's not so much what the story is about, but how you interpret it and your evidence as to why. So with the forms out of the way, I'd also I'd like to move into the other part of this video, which is to our discussion of uh, much ado about nothing and Shakespeare or in our reading assignment uh, for this week. So this is an uh, one of Shakespeare's comedies. It was written somewhere around 1598, 1599, something like that. Um, and it's probably one of his more interesting comedies. I mean, not, I mean, every Shakespeare play is interesting, to be perfectly honest. But this one's got some unique reasons for us to be interested in it, especially in the 21st century. To note, and that's a pun, I guess, and, and ironic in a sense, once I explain it, uh, about this play is... 
the title itself, Much Ado About Nothing. Now, you have to know some, some things about the 16th century England. Uh, the word nothing at the time, and maybe to a degree now, is, was synonymous with female genitalia. Right? Nothing is representative of a vagina. Right? That's the way Elizabethan England thought of it. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. Um, this is just a, uh, a polite euphemism, if you will, uh, to represent that. Now, there's another thing that's interesting about the word nothing in its original historical context. It was not pronounced nothing. The English pronounced it noting. Now, that's also important to, to note, if you will. Uh, it's representative of a distinction. So we have a couple of things going on here just from the title alone. One thing is that first, uh, you know, much ado about nothing in the sense that literal nothing, right? Zero. Um, though is zero really nothing? I don't know. Uh, a void. Something that isn't there, right? That's one interpretation of that title. But also we have a second interpretation, which is much ado about female genitalia. Again, very apropos, I would say, in terms of this play. And third, much ado about noting, right? Making a distinction. So we have all three of those sort of meanings at play at once. And I think they all sort of go into our understanding of the play and can really help us uh, when we look at the Deception article and when we get into our discussions on the form. So this play is, is pretty unique in that it's sort of structured around a couple different groups of characters, uh, particularly their sort of romantic liaisons. Uh, the first and probably the most obvious, the ones that everybody talks about when they talk about Much Ado About Nothing, is Benedict and Beatrice. These are the, the ultimate sparring couple. Um, maybe only usurped by uh, Kate and Petruchio. These are, you know, this is like the prototypical, archetypal, bickering couple that says they hate each other, but really love each other underneath. Um, because they are so perfect for each other. I think that's one of the things that makes it believable. Yeah, they're spending the entire play talking about how the other person is the worst thing in the world. Um, you know, and Benedict has this I, uh, insane idea of, you know, he's going to be a bachelor the rest of his life. I guess it's not really insane. But in the sense that he is a man who will never find a woman he will absolutely love uh, for the rest of his life. He's just looking for sexual conquest and, and that pursuit. Uh, Beatrice has a slightly different perspective. She sort of sees every man as a dog and really not worth her time. They're not very smart in most cases. They don't have much wit. Really, why would she waste her time? But I think that stubbornness is what makes these two characters so obviously perfect for each other. Um, and they're both highly intelligent, right? They're both kind of have this attitude, they're better than everyone else. And it's that, you know, that, uh, that conflict, I think, that brings out the best in both of them, especially when they begin to work together uh, by the play's end to sort of uh, right this wrong that has uh, occurred. You know, we see them as those people they really are. The next relationship I want to mention in the, the play is uh, Claudio and Hero. Uh, these are, I would say these are our actual protagonists, or as close to a protagonist as this play has. Claudio is the, the you know, our, strangely enough, kind of our hero. And it's interesting to note that he, for much of the play, is presented as sort of the authority, the right path right? Because he is looking for love. He's coming to Don Pedro to ask for his daughter's hand, um, and he falls in love with Hero because she's so beautiful and wonderful and, and chaste, right? Specifically that she's a virgin. Um, and there's this absolute 
divinity in this love he has for her. Of course, at the wedding, uh, spoilers if you haven't read the play yet, I mean, it's only, uh, you know, like 500 years old, so I, I don't really care about your spoilers anyways. Spoilers, this is just going to go on a rant for a sl slight moment, are totally stupid. Uh, they do not take away from your enjoyment of a, of a text. So anyways, what was I saying? Claudio and Hero, uh, their relationship is put into jeopardy because of a slight, right? Claudio is very easily uh, deceived by Don John. Um, not that Don John's the, the one that deceives, or, well, he is the one that deceives him, but it's a little more complicated than that. Um, he's deceived by reportage, by noting, by gossip. And it's something, and I think this is sort of Shakespeare's point, that doesn't really matter, especially for lower class people. Um, you know, who cares about whether somebody's a virgin or not? Uh, does that really reflect on their character? Isn't that essentially, as the play, is, you know, is saying with its title, nothing? Um, and I think that puts into the into question sort of Claudio's he hero status, uh, especially when contrasted with Benedict, who at the start of the play is the fool, but by the end seems to be the one who is much more, um, you know, willing to look outside himself. So one of the things we notice about this play, and it's something that sort of segues into the JSTOR article, uh, is that theme of deception. And I would say going along with that too is this theme of um, infidelity, uh, though I don't know that infidelity is really the right, the right word. Maybe we're thinking more about, uh, if we want to put it in a modern day context, something like slut shaming. Uh, we have a man who's perfectly happy and it's perfectly reasonable that he goes out and beds as many women as he likes. He's free to have as much sex as he wants. It's expected of him in society. It's a gender role he's playing into. However, when the accusation comes that Hero may not be the virgin she proclaims to be, there's a whole upheaval in this society. Uh, people are up in arms. Even Don Pedro, Hero's father, is appalled by this revelation, even though it's untrue. And I think that's something you have to talk about when you talk about this play. Why is it that the man is being sort of lifted up as this wonderful guy for being able to have sex with a lot of different partners, whereas the woman's only allowed to have sex with that one person? It sort of raises that question, well, if it's so great for the guy to have sex with so many different people, who is he going to have sex with if everybody's got to be a virgin? It seems a little like much ado about nothing. Again, we're just going to play with that pun all week. Um, it's definitely something you have to consider and look in that term, those terms of de deception. It's not just deception of others, but self-deception as well. So with the Heinz article... Uh, he writes about deception and much ado about nothing, and he's talking about uh, what we would call, or literary critics would call, this idea of binary opposition. Um, essentially, what we're talking about is that binaries, there are two sides to every schema. There is, for everything, there is an other, right? Think of it in terms of man, woman, right? That's a gender binary, Um you know, or you think about uh, black-white, right? A color binary. Uh, you know, there's a, a whole range of things, good and evil. These are all binaries. And in the Hind article, we have this binary of two different types of deception. You know, essentially good and bad deception. So according to Hines, he's saying, well, what Don Pedro does... Uh, in order and and his friends, in order to get Beatrice and Benedict together, is the good kind of deception, right? Because really, uh, Benedict and Beatrice are deceiving themselves, and they're using deceit to reveal truth. However, in Don John's case, he's using deceit in order to introduce conflict and strife. Right? This is the wrong kind of deception. And I think it's a very interesting article. 
um, that takes probably the most new critical look at a text uh, that we've seen all semester. So keep that in mind, especially this idea of those binaries. You know, everything essentially is a binary. There's always another end of the spectrum. And when you start looking, especially with this play, at sort of those binaries and how Shakespeare plays with them, uh, these ideas of man, man, woman, um, especially in gender roles, you know, even though this is written in 1600 and we're told that we're all victims of our gender roles, we have to play out what it means to be a man and what it means to be a, be a woman or whatever, Shakespeare doesn't really seem to buy into that in 1600 when apparently, I don't know, people were even more sexist than they are today. It's obviously a little bit more complicated than at least the way we're told it is. Um, you know, Shakespeare's looking at men and women in a very interesting way, but he's also looking at sort of the way society views it as well. And we're getting this complicated um, look at things that you wouldn't expect, at least you, you wouldn't notice, because you're constantly thinking about the highbrow language and Shakespeare and, you know, things like Romeo and Juliet. Well, this is, you know, he didn't write every play the same way. This is a much more complex and much more interesting, I would even argue, uh, play than a, you know, a tragedy like Romeo and Juliet. So that's it for this week. I will catch you next time. Peace.